Today's meeting of the Velshi Band Book Club is underway. I'm joined by two Romeo and Juliet experts. Professor Jeffrey Wilson is a Shakespeare scholar at Harvard University, and Dr. Sophie Duncan is a research fellow and dean for Magdalen College at the University of Oxford. She's also the author of the new book, Searching for Juliet, The Lives and Deaths of Shakespeare's First Tragic Heroine. Thanks to both of you for being with us. What an exciting time. Uh, William Shakespeare wasn't available, but we're glad that you two were. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Duncan, and let me ask you, I touched on the intergenerational relevance of Romeo and Juliet in the introduction. All of Shakespeare's plays and sonnets have universality. That makes them classics. But in your estimation, what it is, is it about Romeo and Juliet that continues to resonate as much as it does? I think because Shakespeare has such tremendous sympathy for Romeo and Juliet, one of the things he changes about his sources is that he really squarely blames the parents we think of the teenager as something that is a kind of product of the 1960s and that generation. But in fact, I'd say he invents the teenager. Lots of people, maybe until now, encounter this play for the first time as teenagers. Mm -hmm. And after that, I think there's something wonderfully nostalgic about the idea of first love, which means this is a play we enjoy returning to. Uh, Professor Wilson, let's let's talk about the balcony scene. It is probably the most famous scene in English literature. I'm going to read the first two lines of it. But soft, what light through yonder window breaks? It is the east, and Juliet is the sun. Talk to me about this moment in the play and what has made that scene unusually iconic. Well, the, uh, Romeo and Juliet's embroiling controversy. There's controversies going on with Florida. There was controversy in the in 1968 with the Zeffirelli film. But the biggest controversy in the circles that we run in is that the word balcony never appears in the text of Romeo and Juliet. And to me, the, the, there's not a, a more iconic associated moment with this play, arguably with all of Shakespeare, than the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. I suppose it speaks to kind of the way in which we in the audience will project what we do with Shakespeare's text back onto Shakespeare's intent. I like that. Um, Dr. Duncan, one uh, member of the Velshi Band Book Club from Vermont wrote us with his reaction to Romeo and Juliet, quote, my biggest concern with the play was always the glorification of suicide for unrequited love. These are two young teens kept apart by their parents who chose to kill themselves rather than be apart. I always thought there needed to be a serious discussion of why Shakespeare made that the ending, as if suicide is a select, uh, solution to any problem. Of course not, he says in parentheses, and how young hearts heal and things really do get better. Your take on that? I think it's such an important point. And too often, I think the Romeo and Juliet story is used to glorify toxic ideas about love that, you know, love hurts it's, if it's, if, it, if, you know, you need to fight for love, um, turning against everyone you love, you've known before is romantic. But I think the idea that the play glorifies suicide is because of how um, film and production since have presented it. If, if you read the play, the ending isn't romantic. It's a mess. Um, Juliet kills herself out of panic because she's been abandoned by Friar Lawrence, her confidant. She doesn't want to become a nun. And the reason the lovers kill themselves, is, it, I, I think, is very much to show, for Shakespeare, showing the parents how senseless and terrible the cost of their feud is. It's not a glorification of a, the romance. It's the consequences of the senseless feud between the families. Jeff, your take on that? Yeah, I so think... Romeo and Juliet sort of asks uh, to me kind of four, four key questions. And so first is, is the love of Romeo and Juliet something to pursue or something to avoid? And second is, how do we as parents handle our children's shift from subjects who we can control and protect into self-determining adults who are frequently horny? And third is, what happens when children with poor skills of emotional problem solving, as Sophie's talking about, have easy access to lethal weapons? And fourth is, what are the prospects for social reform after partisan politics lead to the death of children? 
Well said. Um, uh, Dr. Duncan, in your book, and I want to go forward what you just said. You said it wasn't a romantic ending, it was a mess. Uh, in your book, Searching for Juliet, you note that Juliet dies because, in, you, in your words, quote, a series of bad decisions made by men. Romeo kills Tybalt, which leads to his banishment. Her father emotionally uh, abuses her and accelerates her forced bigamous marriage. These events pr prompt Friar Lawrence's chaotic and un ultimately derailed plan. Um, that's a, a, a typical. Sorry, th this is not a uh, typical reading of Romeo and Juliet. No, but I think it's a reading that Shakespeare's first audiences would have understood that, um, and I think Jeffrey's point is excellent about, is this a love which is to be pursued or avoided? And for many reasons, Shakespeare's first audiences would have understood this is a love which is to be avoided. They don't know each other. The families are not functioning at all well. And in the Elizabethan era, when Shakespeare wrote the play, one of the markers, what, what you, to be ready for marriage, you had to be behaving and thinking and functioning as an adult. Since neither Romeo nor Juliet is yet capable of behaving that way, um, they end up, rather than becoming a proper married couple and pursuing a real marriage, they end up being buffeted, and Juliet in particular, by the decisions of the men around them. I mean, Juliet is so sheltered. This is a girl who only leaves her parents' house to go to church. This is a girl who doesn't seem to know anybody in her city. She's painfully isolated. And I think this is a kind of a reading before romance. The play was always hugely successful in Shakespeare's day, but I think it was understood far more as a tragedy, as a shocking play, rather than a vision of any kind of aspirational love story. Uh, Jeff, one particularly memorable moment from the play is a warning from Friar Lawrence to Romeo. Uh, these violent delights have violent ends and they're in their triumph die like fire and powder, which as they kiss consume the sweetest honey is loathsome in its own deliciousness and in the taste confounds the appetite. Therefore love moderately, love, long love doth so, too swift arrives as tardy as too slow. Okay, not only is this really the crux of the play, don't act compulsively for love. The language is kind of amazing too, Jeff. Yeah, mo moderation was one of the ideals of, of uh, Renaissance ethics. Um, so the idea is the Aristotelian golden mean, don't be too hot, don't be too cold, don't be too fast, don't be too slow. Um, Shakespeare, uh, as, as you discussed, uh, is adapting this play from uh, an earlier text by Arthur Brooke, written some 30 or 40 years earlier, and he takes a romance that develops over the course of a year and crunches it down into to three days. And so the speed with which Romeo and Juliet fall in love with each other um, draws people to question whether or not this is genuine love. Could it be genuine love? Because Romeo is just coming off this apparently terrible breakup that he had yesterday with Rosalind, and now he is head over heels uh, in love with uh, Juliet. But yet, when when you see those moments, when you see the balcony scene, when you, when you see the, the the poetry between Romeo and Juliet, it's really hard not to get wrapped up with the the, the passion that they express for each other, with the sincerity of the, the 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 happiness that they find in each other, and and so you have this this tension um, kind of mounting, uh, asking what does it mean to to love moderately um, that's tied up with the speed in which they fall in love. I'm so grateful to two of you for uh, bringing this back to life for us. Jeffrey Wilson, Shakespeare scholar at Harvard University, and Dr. Sophie Duncan, research fellow and dean for Magdalen College at the University of Oxford and author of the new book, Searching for Juliet, The Lives and Deaths of Shakespeare's First Tragic Heroine. Romeo and Juliet isn't the only play that's faced the ire of book banners. This week on the Velshi Band Book Club podcast, we've given, more, given even more Shakespeare, featuring The Tempest, the first of Shakespeare's comedies and one of my favorite plays. The amazing Margaret Atwood, is going to join me to discuss the importance of The Tempest and her modern adaptation of it called Hag's Seed. There are so many reasons to read and study Shakespeare, including lasting cultural influence, historical significance, and grasp of the English language. The words Shakespeare invented, the phrases he's coined, are still part of our lexicon today, more than 400 years later.